Great. All righty. Let's just get started. So some of this will be a repeat if people were in the class last time. Um, this this link up here is where I put all my material for the Trenton Computer Festival. So the intro to Python, the uh, program your EV vehicle with Python, and and this is right here. And I'm gonna okay. we're gonna work in um, the in a, in a browser based thing called Jupyter, Jupyter Notebook. Um, Anybody here um, not not have any Python experience? Okay. Anybody here have too much experience? Okay. So <clears throat> this is beyond the Python, you know, write a script to, to you know sort some people and make a mail list or whatnot. Um, it's about object orientedness and all of the extension points that you can have in Python. Um, anything that'll make your life easy will be in it. Um, bigger is to tell me if I need make bigger. It's okay. There. Um, <clears throat> so why do we care? Well, we care because it, poor programming is organized around objects and data rather than action logic, which isn't always the way it, the case, right? Just functional programming. But the idea is to attempt to make things simple, simpler to understand break it into usable parts and things like that, because really good programming is it's really hard. I don't think anybody here will deny that. Um, of course, if we just kind of review the, the, the principles of object rendered programming, you know, encapsulation, you know, hide the stuff no one needs, uh, abstract things, uh, and provide ways of manipulating things without knowing ex explicitly what they are. There's always polymorphism, uh, which allows things to participate in a common collection um, to create some specific behavior. And of course, we also want to be able through that polymorphism to create a single behavior under many different circumstances, which is, I guess we call that uh, overloading, the other one being overriding. Oh, can you add that last thing on the top of the screen? Can you some of your Oh, maybe. Is that this one? There you go. Yeah. You got it now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there you go. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so what tools do we have to do that? Well, normal languages like C++, we have we have objects, right? We can group functionality based on real world things and create, you know, models that that sort of act that way. Uh, we can use inheritance, um, and we'll we'll start with looking at building Python classes and all that kind of stuff. And all of a sudden, at the end, I think the answer is they aren't aren't specifically needed. And in some cases, I wonder why we do them. Um, so here, there's going to be an example of some code um, that we'll sort of work through. Um, the idea is we want to be able to print citation types on our word processor, given whether it's a book, a magazine, or a website, and we want it to format according to what they're supposed to be. This might be a real contrived example, but I think it'll help. Um, so each of the different objects has uh, these properties, right? And so when we create the citation, we'll print those values in different ways. We'll actually construct the objects differently. So if we look, we can create a list of, of the sources of our, whatever it is we're writing, and this is what they might look like. Um, and in a traditional case, we'd start doing this crazy thing where we'd say for all the sources, if the type is book, we can format it this way. And we put all the logic in one spot. So when we have to add another one, we add it here. We have to split open everything. You've seen this, right? You got to update 100 different places where everybody's sort of in a pinch point logically. <clears throat> with object oriented development, the idea would be let's create an object. And with each of those objects, they'll have a, func they'll have a method called print citation. And then we just knew of that object. And when we're ready, we can just call it. So it looks something like this. 
And of course, we'll have to have some base you know, in a language like C, we have to have the base class. Anybody don't see? C, oh, I'm at C++, but yeah. Uh, you got to have some sort of base class for this all to work, right? And so you make a base class called print citation. Um, and then you would new them up individually in the list, just like this, whatever values were there. Um, and then we could just say for sources and sources, for source and sources, source, print, citation, we're done. Okay, a lot, lot cleaner. Now the business logic, which is where all this is, this represents business logic, doesn't have to have all these if statements in. And the if statements are in the new things that we add. We want a new. We want to add a new item. We just create a new class derived from citable source, and we can just drop it in, and, and supposedly it all just works. And these are just some pointers to the things that we talked about up above. Uh, is there anything? There's not really anything particularly interest for us because I think I talked about it. So let's talk about some terminology. Um, <clears throat> think, of, think of a class as sort of a template of how to make something. That's the, it's the cookie cutter. And the objects are like the cookies, the instance. They're instances of a class. So classes uh, and their objects both have attributes and methods. Yes, a cookie cutter can have a method so that everybody basically, so all, let's say all cookies have this method. So, you know, I, they could all be eaten. <laughs> so you don't bother making a method on the instance of the cookie, you wanna make it on the class. Um, you can have a, an attribute, right, which you might attribute to the class, but you can also have individual attributes on an object because maybe maybe some of them are different, right? So how many sides does the cookie have? If it's, it's a circle. I don't know what that means, zero. But, you know, let's say you, you want to create it, and then when you create this cookie, you say, oh, this square cookie has four sides, and this triangle cookie has three sides. So you can set them individually. It's a an attribute of a cookie, but it's an individual per instance attribute. And I'm just basically trying to understand, make sure that everybody who doesn't know object oriented gets. Does anybody not know about object oriented anything? Okay, does this make any sense to you? Okay, so I don't want to leave anybody in the dust. Um, so let's let's put together a simple class. Okay, <laughs> we're going to use the class keyword, and then we're going to follow that with the colon, just like we did in my previous class, the, the if loops and things, everything that's a structure of some sort ends in a colon, and then an indent, right? And then for right now, we're just going to put pass, which is a placeholder, for I'm going to put something here later. Pass in Python is no op, basically. And then we're going to use that class to make an object. So here we made a book, and we construct a book, and we're gonna call it lowercase book, and we're gonna print it. Now, when we do this, we get this funny thing here, like that. But that's basically just saying, I got a reference to a book. Uh, it looks like this is probably the address to it, but don't be calling that, because that'll get us in trouble. Um, but that's all it is. We don't get any visual, any in, internal view, view of the book. We'd have to write something that would print the book when we call print. And there's actually an extension point for that, which we'll talk about when we get down there. So the next thing we need, need to do for our, our class is we need to have a constructor, right? Because you always have a constructor. How do you make it? And you have to have attributes, you have to have methods. Um, one of the things you have to remember is that you can only have one constructor in Python for an object. And that constructor is init. And at this point, I have to say, these are called dunder methods. See the under, under, and the end under, under, under. They, I don't know why they call them dunder, but they do. They're dunder methods. They're, they're meant to be internal. You're never really supposed to call them. And in fact, some people sometimes use a single under, underscore for their internal variables for, a, say, class singling. Please don't call this. Um, double means really don't call this. And it turns out you could call it anyway because there's nothing, there's nothing private in Python. There's no notion of private or protected variables. You can get in anything inside of an object. 
And so that's why we have to have visual signals to tell us to a gentleman's agreement not to mess with it. Um, when you see a method in Python, you'll see self on a class. Turns out like in C++, the syntax, the, 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 the parser knows, oh, when I see a method, I know that I will prepend a, a pointer when I call the thing and it knows it calls it this. But does it work that way in Python? In Python, when you call a method, it takes the pointer of the object and puts it in the parameter list itself as, as self. So when I call a knit, when I knew up, when I knew this object up here, no, well, there's no newer deleter or anything like that. Um, it called this method. Well, actually, it, it created a place for the object, uninitialized, and then passed that place pointer to this so that you could put things in it. And the first thing you're going to put in it is you're going to put some private variables. Notice I use the underscore called title, author, and copyright. So gentleman's agreement, nobody's going to call those, nobody's going to set those things without a setter or a getter, and they're all supposed to be internal. Uh, I'm also going to create a method called print citation. So for a book, the citation is going to be formatted, uh, whatever, however this print statement is set up. Um, does this print statement look familiar to everybody? They understand how it works. It's, these are the positional arguments that get put in zero, one, and two. And so we're going to construct one of those books, okay? And then we're going to print it. This is critical. This is critical. Can we see it on our screen? No, at the top of your screen. Very, very top. We have oh, thank you. See, earlier, earlier the guy before me was lingering, <laughs> and he still had his stuff plugged in. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. So when I ran this, I got my citation. Okay. Everything good, right? We've made a class. We've given it some attributes. Notice that the attributes are just like, Put them on the initial lines, right? It turns out I can do I can do crazy stuff. Oh, I just want to make sure you know this. Uh, I don't want to see anything. I can create a new attribute anytime, anywhere, any place. Now, this this object has title, author, and copyright whenever it's constructed, guaranteed. But It'll have time if you ever call print or print citation. It's kind of weird, right? To get yourself in trouble. So as a general rule, unless you intend to do this, make sure that anything you put, you've maybe put some realistic value here so that Make sure you put this up here like that, so at least it has a value. Because if you call a value, if you call it, if you use an attribute on something that doesn't have an attribute, that attribute, your program will stop. And it won't stop at the beginning. It'll stop after it's been running for a while and doing things. And then when you hit it, boom, you die. Because that's the sad part about interpretive languages. They don't fail at compilation time because there is no compilation. The interpreter will, however, scan the entire code. And if there's any real syntax errors, it will tell you about them before it starts to execute. But you can't rely on the fact that it's it, it all works just because it starts running. And it also means it's it also means that if you got to test this, a lot of people use Python as a, a prototyping language. But if you're writing production stuff, it means you have to test every every path because you never know okay so let's let's go pardon um oh well it'll see these but again you might have meant to do it so cool 
actually haven't used Pilot. I probably ought to, but I just haven't. Um, you get to the point where you just take care of it and then they don't really need it. Um, so the class above has three object attributes. We talked about that. Um, we talked about Python supports dynamic typing. Um, and that is that everything is defined by what we put in them. It has nothing to do with the, 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 we don't make a framework and say, it's gonna look like this. It, it looks like this because that's how I treated it. And then um, since this con constructor defines them, I'm guaranteed they'll always exist no matter whether I have a book. We talked about that too. Okay, we had two methods. We talked about init, which is a special method. It's called whenever you construct an object. You have a print method. We talked about how self is always put in. Can anybody tell me what happens if I do this? Right, it's a local variable. It doesn't really, it doesn't, once I get out of int, it's gone. So it's not really, it's not really gonna be part of the instance. Thank you. Um, and so self is very important when you're working Self is very important when you're working inside an object. Um, and you reference methods and variables through self. So if you wanted to call, if you wanted to call print citation, you have to do this. Because you can't see that method unless you have self on it. Make sense? It's inside of the class, self is magical. It's the only way to refer to yourself. Okay, we talked a little bit about the privacy model. Uh, and that is by convention, single underscores mean that users are discouraged from using a function or an attribute. Double means you're really strongly discouraged, but of course, nothing is private. Everything is public. Um, syntactically, uh, when you do certain things, ah, this is the one of the extension points. When you do certain things in Python, it magically calls some of these methods that have under under on them. So when we did when we print, for instance, when I just say print the object, there is a way. This one right here. There is a way to define a method that when print is called, it will it will call a method on that book that defines how to print it. So it now becomes printable. And it's printable for anybody you have, you pass the object to. So I can make a package that's got complex objects in it and you can import it, use my objects and say print on them and then it'll actually print. There's also a package called P print, which lets you pretty print a lot of the things that you normally can't print or you have to write your own methods. Through. And these special, these special methods are in here and we're gonna look at them if we have time. Okay, so <clears throat> class level attributes, uh, we talked about, we talked about instance. Those are all instance methods and instance properties. In other words, have values based for each, at each invocation of the constructor, I can have a different set of copyright title and whatnot. Right. In this case, we're going to talk about how we make meth we make values that are persistent across all objects of a specific specific type. So class book, we're going to say I have a citation type and it's going to be called book. Now, this data is not associated with the instance. It's associated with the class, but it's accessible from any instance. What's what's useful about that is there's only one copy of this data for all the copies of book we make. Does that make sense? So if you've got data that applies to all the different types of objects of that class, then don't put them in the object, put them in the class. Because now you'll save memory, you'll save time, all those good things. So the citation type will now be a variable that's on every single instance of book. Um, we saw our constructor, we saw print citation, which has been repeated. Now we're going to make methods that are class methods 
and static methods use what's called a decorator. These are called Python decorators. They come with the language that allow you to say, this method here, this is a class method. So any book can call, you can take a book and call this method and it will give you this, this message. Now notice, the only thing we have accessible are class values. So only the class data is available in a class method because you don't know the, you don't know the actual instance that got called. So if you wanna know the type of something, you can say, hey, what's your type? Since that type name up at the top was shared across all of them, you can just print it there. In this case, I'm using class name. Um, and you don't have to have, you don't have to have it attached to each object. Static method, uh, I have to read my message. So let's go ahead and make a, we'll make a book. We're gonna say this citation, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna cheat. I'm going to set the private private method to of the of the book type to magazine, and all of a sudden my my book becomes a magazine. I'm going to cheat. This is really bad practice. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to print the name of the book as a uh, in the book class. We're going to print the name of the book from a book. They should be the same, and then I could. I could call it a static method. Um, and I can call it from either or. So let's see. What we should have gotten there is it's now a magazine. I got the same message whether I called it from the class book, which is, I think, this one right here. And or the object itself, and the same thing with the static method. So let's go through these. So I said citation, citation type is a class attribute. There's only one value, it's stored with the class, not with the objects, but all the objects have access to it. It's private because I use the underscore, but yes, you can still get it if you don't. Um, the class methods, uh, Print name is a class method. Um, they can be invoked either by the class or by the object of that class. So you can always use the class method for many objects. And uh, class methods receive a reference to the class when you call them, not not the uh, not the instance. So if you went up here and look, if right here, yeah, here, see this class method gets CLS, right? And the difference between a static method and a class method is this method doesn't 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 have access even to the inf information for the class. It's kind of like just out there, but it's hung on the class. So you can access it by calling class, but it's not actually working on any any particular class. Um, Okay, so print citation type is a class static method. Static methods may be invoked on either the class or the object, but they don't receive the class that they belong to. That's the only difference. We talked about decorators. What is that amper, that at thingy? Well, de decorators allow you to do something called aspect, aspect oriented programming. Essentially what you're gonna do is you wrap a function with another function that just passes through to the other function. So I could make a decorator that was a timer, right? My decorator, and we might and we might have, I don't, might be an example, I don't know. But we can write a function that we say is a decorator, and it's a timer. What happens is it takes the time at the beginning, and it calls your thing, and then it calculates the delta time at the end and prints the value, the delta. That's a timer. So now I could just wrap this function with the timer by saying at timer, and then every time you call it, I can calculate the time. It gives me, it prints out the time that, to call it. When I'm done, I can just take the, take the amper off and I don't change the code underneath. So it's a way of making wrappers on other classes. And you can stack them so you can have wrappers on wrappers of wrappers. And these, I said, are supplied by the language itself. So let's talk about inheritance. So we had a class called citable source. Uh, it's going to have to have a class variable 
called next number of one because every time we create a new object, we have to give the book a new number, right? So that's gonna be like our counter. Every time there's a new instance of citable source, we're gonna get a new number. And so here we are, we say, uh, when you init, I want you to get the new, I want you to get the next number and put it in my number. So my instance number is gonna be whatever the current next number is. And then I want you to increment the next number. And because it's in the class, it's a class variable, it's kind of like global for everybody in that class, right? And then I have a thing that says, return the number of myself. <clears throat> and then there's a print that's a just a base implementation that says, I want you to just print my number so I know what number I am. So now we're gonna derive a bunch of objects from that base class. And to do that, you put the base class in, in parentheses. So the book will be a, a type of citable, sor citable source object. It will have a constructor. It will call the base constructor because you have to do that explicitly. So you have to call the base constructor explicitly by saying what the, in this case, what the type is and then calling the init. This is one of those cases where you do the, the thing you weren't supposed to do. Uh, and then it has its normal values like title, author, and copyright. We have something that allows us to print the citation, which by the way is different than, nope, this is the default, right? If no one implements print citation, it'll use the base class version, right? Okay. And this is the one that goes for book. And as boring as it is, there's one for magazine, which has slightly different stuff slightly different output. And now um, we're gonna make an unknown because I think, did we make that? Well, what the heck? Then we're gonna make a book, we're gonna make a magazine. Yeah, I don't think that's right. I think that should have been the other thing. One, why? Is one. Did I have something called unknown up? Yeah, oh, okay, I have an unknown up here that doesn't do anything. Okay, I didn't realize that. It could have also been citable. Store. Well, yeah, it could have been. Could have been this. That's what I thought I was going to do. This should work as well. Unless it doesn't. It does, yeah. So I can make a citable source, which has a default of just give me my number. I can have a book which says, give me my number and the format for a book, or I can have a magazine that says, give me my number and print out the format for um, a magazine. Okay, so I gotta stop because that was a lot. Anybody, question? I don't mind answering questions. If you throw th something, just throw something soft. Okay, so let's go through the highlights. Inheritance indicates um, is indicated by a class, a class with the closing base class name in it. That was that parenthesis thing we saw right here. Okay. Uh, the default base class constructor will be called will be called unless it's explicitly called when inheriting the base class. So that's why we explicitly called it. Um, the attributes and methods can be accessed via either the self variable, self variable, or this cool variable called super. And I don't know, did, was there one in there? Where where did I see super? Let's skip that. Yeah, right there. See, so super get the base class value for number. Um. And this, of course, allows us to implement default behavior. So that may be the only reason you'll ever want to have a class hierarchy. Because if you don't have default behavior, you don't care. Um, yeah, because we're going to go through that. And that's why we talk about duck typing. If it walks like a duck, it swims like a duck, it quacks like a duck, it's duck. Doesn't matter. So we're going to create a class called unknown. 
with print citation. We're going to create, create a class called book with a print citation. We're going to class, we're going to have a magazine class. Notice none of these classes are related to each other in any way. The only way that they and the only common thing they have about them is they have a function that takes the same set of arguments with the same name. That's it. You want to add another one? Just write it. I don't care. We're going to take that and we're going to construct a, a list of citations. We're going to slap them in there and we're going to just print the citation. We don't care. No base class needed. Done. And if I can, and I can argue that if you make the class, you could put the behavior in it. So why do you need default behavior? So the whole class hierarchy thing kind of, kind of blows up, isn't always necessary. And I haven't really found a case where I really had, just had to have it. Yeah. Fair enough. But I think you could actually, well, and you can't overload in the sense that you couldn't undo his, his method. Yes, okay. Well, you, you, can over, you can override it by wrapping it with the class. But you can still, but super is the access to the inherited. Right, right. But I, what, I, what I was going to say, what I was thinking when I said that is you could just get the logger and slap a new method on it. Yes. But you can't get a logger and replace a method. Well, you can, but you don't know what that other method does now. It gets all ugly. Yeah. So very rarely do you really need to. I'm going to go the opposite. But only from other people's stuff, right? Do you still use a lot of objects? I don't know. I, I kind of prefer the duck typing because it's just, it works better. Well, it, it especially becomes relevant in the particular context of the centers. And because you talked about the fact that when an object is passed into the pit, it will control the types, passes the numbers and numbers, passes the string to string. Yeah. The getters and centers, though, it can force typings to your class. So your, your setter can say, well, if you pass me a string, I will turn it into an entry. Or I will throw an exception to say, I don't accept it. Okay. And that is much more complex using the duck method than it is in inherited classes. So you can write the setters. Well, if you've got a lot of common data, yeah, I get that. Yeah. So for name, as a, as a setter, it will inherit a string, I will inherit a string class. This way I don't have to enforce it. Okay. So that's how you get class inheritance. Interesting. Okay. Well, that, that's where it's just. Um, okay. Especially with the. Now, that's the other thing. I've never seen like more than. I've never been around more than one or two people working on the same Python. That must be terrible. Oh, you the guy with the million lines of Python? There was one year some guy was here and he said, and we were talking about 2.7, uh, 2 Python 2.7 and going to three. And, and, and he said he had, he had like a million lines of 2.7. Oh, Howie. Okay. Yeah. All right. So sometimes you you want to use it a lot. It complicates things at one level, but it makes algorithm protection for string that informs to something. Rather than everybody having to piece it into their own, they can just inherit my my objects. Fair enough. You try to code out. Don't repeat. 
Yes. Right. I can see that. Um, so I want to get back on this. No, no, that's great. I, I want that. Um, each, uh, let's see, citations in the list. Each of them are constructed in place because here's the constructors in place. Uh, the list doesn't care what kind of objects that are there. Again, heterogeneous. Uh, they're dynamically, since Python is dynamically typed, they don't care about what they are. They're just in the list. And if I create a new class that acts like citation, I can just throw it in. And it, again, if it walks like a duck, it swims like a duck, it quacks like a duck, it's stuck. Okay, so the special method. Is there a base? I didn't know that. There's a Okay, it just doesn't explicitly come up like in uh, other languages. Right, instead of having the same class dump and base out there, the yeah. class dump and carry. There's a base in there. I did not know that. Interesting. So I told you that we're talking about extension points. We talked about classes. We talked about duck typing. That it does, you know, mix and match. Um, there's also the ability to leverage all these extensibility points in the language. The language will stop and run certain functions when you do things. And one which is common is the width. You'll see this this happen. What you're doing here is files are very a scarce resource in a system and when you open them, you should close them when you're done with them. And we often forget to do that. So we create mechanisms that close our file when it goes out of scope. Scope is when it comes out of the indent, basically. And so in this case, there's the width, I don't know, operator, keyword, whatever, that acts in a special way. And what it does is it calls a special function of whatever is here so that you can run any of these lines using it and then call something else when it's done. So I guess file is the thing that has the method called enter and exit. Well, it has an open, but it has a, it has a, a dunder, a dunder enter and a dunder exit. Right. Yes, it has a method. You'll see the methods open and read, but it turns out that the file has this thing that looks like and like this, enter and exit. And they do special things. And some of this stuff you can kind of ignore because for a file, all you really care about is closing it. So uh, let's go on, what's going on with this whip? Uh, let's just walk through the, the text. Um, when we open things, we like to close them. I said that. Uh, when F goes out of scope, ideally it would be great if it would just close it, right? Um, you may think the, that the syntax is possible because file open is part of a Python language, but actually it's po possible because there's code in the Python distribution that leverages a set of well-known methods and names. You can create a class called timer and say with timer as, as T and then do all the kind of stuff in it. And at the end, T dot print current uh, elapsed time and it will, it will print elapsed time. and then destruct itself when it goes away. Actually, you don't even have to have the print because when it exits, you can tell it to print. I don't know if I've got one of those as an example, but here's one of these things uh, that I was talking about. Uh, we talked about the enter and exit. So let's see an example. And okay, I do have a timer example. So we're gonna write a timer. And of course the timer has to have an init. We're gonna have a start and end time. And when you enter, we wanna sample the current time. That's all we're going to do. And we're going to save it. And I believe we have to return self because that's part of the requirements for enter. Um, and then we're going to write an exit. I guess a dunder exit is what it's called. And what we're going to do on exit is we're going to take the current time and we're going to subtract this, 
the save time from start, which will give us elapsed time, and we're just going to print it, right? And then we're going to stick that deep in some package someplace that we can just use whenever we want to time things, okay? Now we're going to go about our normal business day and we're writing code, and we want to time something. So we pull out, we, we go import timer, and it imports a timer package. And then we say, with timer, we construct it as T, and we say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sleep here because I don't have any interesting work to do. This time does not have anything to do with the timer. It's just, let's wait for a minute. And then when I'm done, we'll actually wait for two seconds. And then when we're done, we're just going to go out of scope. So when we go out of scope, it'll call that, that dunder exit, and it'll print the elapsed time, which should be around the same amount of time as two seconds because nothing's actually absolutely, you know, this isn't a real-time operating system, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so would this work the same if you had like a timer object that had already been or let's say you say like T is timer print, and then you say with T, time about sleep, would it do the answer and exit? Maybe, I don't think it would, gar the, the responsibility yeah. isn't to garbage collect this. You know what? Yeah. So I think I do it well. Well, let, let's run this and we'll actually try it. So, so if we run this, what we should get is a two second delay and then we'll get the time completed and then another two second delay because we get, we, we do it twice, which I'll now get rid of because we don't really need it. And see it, the, this up here is the same as that. That's what's happening. But because you're using a width, you don't have to call those. They get done for you. So now let's get rid of that. And what you're trying to say, I think, is uh, will that work? Yeah, it works. But yeah, and that and that's great in this case because you're not you're not releasing a resource. But We we wait 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 so wait are you saying now he's teaching me. Okay. Yeah. My problem is the, the stupid pad here. There's the one type error. But but if 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 I was showing you an example of how to make a decorator, yeah, he's right. You could probably do this with decorating. Um, so which one's better? Which of uh, what I had there before, where I actually explicitly called enter and exit and all that, which is better? Well, well, the the width is shorter. Uh, the width guarantees that things get undone when I exit. You know, obviously it's it's better. Um, Let's 
but not 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 like the yeah you have to put it you, if you put it here well how does it know then that is better that is better because the time of object is will be created and you so and then it will be and will be it will be short. It'll get hard to you know put a special place right because the object exists with creates a context on the moment. Ah, so there's actually this is actually wrapped with another level of indentation we don't see. It's an implicit part. Okay. I would really love to know what that is. <laughs> oh. Maybe it's my phone. I didn't check. Also Oh, wow. Okay. So we'll just really breeze through this, but because we've got like five minutes, we're really kind of done. Um, <clears throat> so, how do you get polymorphism? Like, how do you call a function with a different set of arguments? each time and still make it work. But one way you could do that is with uh, args and KWRs. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, KWRs is key value, key value yeah. paired. And the other is, uh, right. just pardon? Okay, and they're just positional. Okay, so, so an example, I'm gonna skip all that, we won't read it. Um, <clears throat> here we're gonna call, Test QBR, we made this function, takes arc one, two, and three, and then it just prints them out. And so we're gonna call them, and but we're gonna make some args, and we put it in a tuple, and then we can just put the star here, which says, take the tuple and make them independent in individual arguments and, and call it, it should just work, it does. So there's that. You're gonna have to read some of this on your own because we're gonna get booted in four minutes. Um, so yes, this is the same as just doing this, that's true. Um, but now I can also do it with dictionaries and that's where the KWR part comes in. So I can say arg three is three, arg two is two, this is that, the other thing. And now when I call it, I get the same thing. It, it works, right? And so what can happen is you could have it take this kind of structure, uh, instruction when it when it gets construct even on a constructor constructor can take that and then now it could be constructed with the variable set of arguments and even one of them could be well here's the subtype of the object I want if you want to get crazy but so in this case just argv what was argv did I have an argv up here Oh, oh, I'm declaring it. I'm sorry. Uh -huh. Right. So when I call that. <clears throat> okay. So this is saying I got a list. And this says they have a dictionary, basically. Yes, you're absolutely right. It doesn't make sense. Oh, oh, you don't have to call it. Well, yeah. Java salt is a key word that you cannot alter. In Python, all the variables that you see out there. Right, but actually changing, not using self, would probably be a little psychopathic because the next person who comes by is going to go, what the hell is all this? Yes. Don't, don't change things unless you have good reason. Oh, there's that too. So here's an example of constructor polymorphism. Okay. So I'm going to take a KWR or dictionary of, of arguments, and I'm going to initialize my values by indexing into that KWR and getting it. 
And this is just a nice little thing that says, if title in KWR else none, uh, basically says this, use this value if titles in args, otherwise use nothing. So it's like a, I keep throwing it's a trinary, it's an, it's an trinary if statement, yeah. basically. It's a great way to parse JSON. Oh, what? Parse JSON? Uh, Best way to parse JSON is get somebody's JSON parsing for us. Okay. Don't okay. write things over. Is this your last example? <laughs> I think it is. This is the first page of cheating. Best example. In the event, the event simply, you can leave the KWR. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I have to come up with contrived examples because of limited time. But yeah, you're right. But the other reason is With this, with the star, star. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, and there's some really crazy stuff they can do. I just got tried to explain Funk Tools partial, which is not my thing, but yeah. And so, and that's it, guys. We we're out of time. I have no idea who's out here. Where is the plant source for this? Same place. Same place as the other one? Yep, all um, three of them. 